Hey folks, welcome back. So we're going to continue our series on the hip muscles. And today we're looking at a pair of muscles called the obturator internus and externus, which is this one here highlighted in the orange. So here we have obturator externus, which is on the front or the anterior part of the body. And then in the posterior aspect, we have obturator internus here. Here. Okay, so let's start with the obturator internus. So its attachment point is essentially, if you look here, this is the, what's called the obturator from foramen, this big hole that can kind of comprise in the ischium and the pubis. So there's a membrane that kind of coats that there or covers that there. You can see the membrane here. Okay. So the obturator. Uh, muscle essentially covers that entire foramen, that entire space. So this entire space here, and attaches along the red ridge of the of the ischium and the pubic bone there. Then it hooks around the sciatic notch, which is this kind of groove here, and then comes posteriorly, and then distally attaches onto the femur in the kind of trochantic notch here. And you can see that there's a bunch of tendons there that are attaching. So we've also got the, our superior gemellus, our inferior gemellus, and our obturator externus. We also will have the periformis coming, sitting just above it. And then just above the periformis, we'll have the glute medius and glute minimus. So this region here is really dense in connections or muscle muscle attachments and tendons attachments. Now these uh, four muscles, the obturator internus, obturator externus, superior, inferior gemellus, they're essentially attaching to one spot. So they're kind of considered to be one group, particularly the obturator internus, superior, inferior gemellus. Uh, they call the tricep coxae group. And you kind of can't separate the three. So you can't individually isolate them and test them. The, when you're testing the muscle function, you're basically testing all three. It's kind of like the tricep muscles in the back of the arm, three muscles attached to one point. So even though they have three distinct heads um, approximately in the shoulder, they go to kind of go to the same place. So it's essentially one muscle. And similar with the tricep pseudo group in the in the ankle, like the calf and the sleeves, share a common tendon, the Achilles tendon. So that's one complex or group of muscles. So that's something just to kind of be aware of. And they're so deep, it's really, really difficult um, to palpate or to even kind of try to find where they are in the hip because you you got to get past the glute max and the glute med and the glute min and the periformis before you can even kind of access these muscles. So they're really, really, really deep um, and it's hard to access manually, all right? <laughs> so just keep that in mind as well. Now, if you look at the fiber direction, see this obturator internus has got this kind of fan shape, but that kind of all creates this line of pull this way. So like all our hip external rotators, when the pelvis is stable and this muscle contracts, it's going to pull on the inside of the femur and because the attachment is posterior okay it's going to create a rotation externally or laterally okay so that's going to turn the leg outward like so all right or if you think about with the kneecaps aligned so the kneecap will rotate outward external rotation so that's like a foot out external turned out so we have these hip external rotators all right we have the periformis was a hip external rotator as well um, and we also have the glute max which is the external rotator now they, they are counted by the big adductor group on the inner thigh um, which are internal rotators so you have a balance between the two and the idea is you want to maintain good balance between the external and internal rotators so then the joint can maintain good position all right. So that's the importance of when you're doing exercise to train um, in a balanced way so that the muscles, if you have one dominant muscle, one strong muscle, that will create a rotation even internally and externally, depending on which one is dominant. And then that positions the joint in a, a, 
in a, a certain orientation where the wear or loading is going to go into joint unevenly. And over time, one theory is that can kind of compromise the articulation of the joint and facilitate or contribute to things like osteoarthritis where you're wearing down a joint because it's not evenly being loaded. So that's one of the theories of kind of muscle balance and also just like muscle function. All right, if you're trying to stabilize and align the femur correctly, the muscles are, you know, working to position, particularly the femur, to line the patella or the knee, because the knee's only hinged, doesn't have a lot of kind of, it has a little bit of kind of rotation, but it needs to be kind of positioned so that when you're walking forward, the hinge can operate real, really smoothly and it's not kind of rotated and compromised to kind of get that rotation. So if, if this is tight, for example, if your hip external rotators are super tight and you're creating this hip external rotation, okay, that's going to create a rotation in the knee, which then it has to compensate with. And it'll either compensate with it by giving you more kind of movement in the ankle or movement more movement in the hip or in the lower back. So it'll go up and down the kinetic chain. And that's kind of one of the art and the science of kind of exercise prescription and training is to kind of creating this muscular balance in clients and our and our um, people we're working with because everyone's structure is slightly different so we have a about an 80 20 kind of rule or distribution we kind of have a good idea of what most squiggle Moscow squiggle system is going to look like and then we are kind of have this individualized approach where we kind of work with the client who's in front of us to create optimal kind of movement now the external obturator Okay, the only difference here is that it's on the front. It's not quite as big as the internal one. It doesn't cover the entire uh, obturator foramen. It kind of comes around the anterior aspect of the ischium, but it essentially is going to the same place and it's going to create the same rotational pull and external rotation on the femur. So these two bad boys together really just do external rotation and then also stabilization of the femur into the acetabulum. So when that muscle contracts, it's going to pull the femur into the socket. So you give that nice snug socket. Right. Uh, because the muscles are so deep and are so small, so they're very difficult to isolate and muscle test. So if you're muscle testing them, essentially what you do is you flex the knee and then test internal external rotation in resisted because this muscle is an external rotator you essentially get someone to try to rotate the femur, all right, turn their knee out, and you resist that movement. And the trick is you've got to try to do that without them using their butt muscles, like the bigger muscles that they'll take over, which will be what they'll want to do. Okay. Uh, so that's a difficult one to assess uh, if these hip stabilizers are actually engaged or working correctly. Nerve supply is coming from the lumbar spine, so the obturator muscle we've got the nerve supply here is l5 s1 so it's coming from this is l5 s1 so out from this region and then the obturator internus is a little bit higher uh, externus correction is a little bit higher up and it's innovation is l3 l4 so a little bit higher up in the back so if you've got a, like an l3 l4 disc injury for example you might have compromised obturator externus but your obturator internus and your superior and inferior mouse muscles will still be working so you've kind of got some redundancies there which is kind of one of the beautiful ways the body is designed so we have a look at the motion of our obturator externus hip in lateral rotation so here knee flexes and then the femur turns out or pivots externally so from the front, knee flexes. And when you have your knee flexed in the external rotation, the foot comes across the midline. Okay. So you've got to really think about the shaft of the femur, which way the shaft of the femur is turning or twisting. Okay. Now, if the leg is straight, if the knee's not flexed, because this knee's muscles only cross the hip joint, it can work in both the knee flex and the knee in full extension or straight leg. Okay. Um, it's not going to show it here, but if that femur rotates externally and goes out this direction, okay, then the knee is going to follow that line. 
And so what you want then is one of the reasons why we train our deep gluteals is so that we don't have excessive bulgus, so the knee is collapsing in. Okay, so we want strong deep gluteal muscles and strong glute max fibers okay, to create this external rotation. Because when we look at the adductors, you'll see there are seven really, really big adductor muscles, which are creating the opposite pull in. And depending on your anatomical structure, how this angle will come down through the femur. But women tend to have a slightly bigger angle just because they've got wider pelvises. So they tend to have a little bit more knee valgus, as in the knees tend to kind of come in a little bit more, which is fine. But we just need to make sure that we get really good glute work in so they can maintain that kind of nice structural balance and integrity, which is what it's all about. Okay, so that's pretty much the obturator externus. Um, if you're training in the gym, if you want to really work these muscles, you can't, as I mentioned, really isolate them with exercise. It's pretty much impossible if you're going to create external rotation of the femur, for example, because the glute match attaches to the femur, all right, and it's the powerful, it's the biggest muscle, it's going to take over, right? So if you're doing clams or um, monster walks or, you know, side lateral um side walking laterally so you're creating hip abduction with a little bit of external rotation resisted off with a band okay you're going to get these muscles firing as a complex as a group and that's kind of a concept you want to think about is how do we work muscles in the groups or the teams so the muscles that are using the same or creating the same action or movement of the joint or movement of the bone how do we train those movements? That's functional exercise. Okay. So there's some exercises which are just classically, we know work really well to create uh, functional movement. And there are just some crazy stuff out there where you need really, really extreme ranges of movement and great stability or years and years of training to be able to execute well. Uh, and, and if you're one of those people, you can do that. Well, that's great. But the average bear, the average Joe, may not have the the, the joint uh, capacity, mobility, stability, strength, uh, neural control, all these other factors where they can actually execute. So one of the things that I always work with my clients is very, very simple, very, very basic. We go back to functional anatomy. What are the joints designed to do? Uh, what are the muscles that create the movements in the joints? And then we when we train movement, not exercises, all right? So that's the difference. So if I want to work the glute max, for example, glute max is a hip extension extensor, so it's going to pull the leg behind you. It's also a slight hip external rotator, and that's also a slight hip abductor, okay? And so the best way to train that is squats, okay? And from squats, you've got, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 different combinations, depending how creative you want to be. But basically, a basic squat done well, you're going to get all these muscles working. So you don't need to do all the fancy pants stuff. Um, if you just focus on the basics and the core fundamental principles of movement, you're going to get a really good training effect. And that's kind of um, the, the approach I like to do, particularly because I'm um, doing a lot of rehabilitation with clients. We basically got to retrain and restore the function of the body. And so we just replicate the movement of the muscles and the muscle groups and the joint actions. And then the rehab process is really starting off really, really, really simple at a low level and then slowly adding in um, resistance or load or volume to create an overload. So the muscle gets the stimulus to grow and adapt and change and, you know, lay down more fibers and get more neural input. And so you get that kind of adaptation. And so it's a step-by-step -step process. And um, that's really the art and science of kind of exercise physiology, exercise rehabilitation, a good personal trainer, a good strong, functional strength coach. I mean, they're all, we're all doing the same stuff, really. It's just how we layer it in. And it's the type of exercises and methods that we like to use because there are lots of different methods and approaches. Uh, but when you kind of bring it back down to functional anatomy, it kind of explains why they're working. All right. So I hope that's helpful. If you have any questions with obturator internus and externus, please feel free to reach out and I look forward to seeing you in our next um, functional anatomy video.